Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I wanted to talk about this plant right behind me because I noticed some comments last week about how there were yellow leaves and I needed to groom the plant. This is a philodendron called Neon and its new growth kind of looks like yellowing dying leaves, which is kind of unfortunate for that plant. So it doesn't have any dead leaves. It's just, that's how it looks. Just wanted to put that out there. You should, you should move it somewhere else. You think so? Well, yeah, maybe. I also have... Like, swap it with the other one over there. I well, I guess they're both in the frame. This weirdo plant right back there. Yeah. This is a Senecio stapeliformis. And it's actually, it, when it came to me, it was only like this tall, I think. Oh, wow. And then it wasn't getting sufficient light. And it kind of was like uh, reaching toward it because I didn't realize the bulb in the back of one of the girl lights wasn't working. Um, or I just had like... Yeah, I needed to twist it to turn it back on. But it's forming two new babies right there, which is really exciting. I probably should put it in a different pot. But this is probably the weirdest plant that I own. Okay, so let's jump into the videos from last week. The first one was Midsummer Plant Maintenance, plus I trimmed in Instant Karma Elderberry into a tree form. Satisfying. Such a satisfying job. And I tried out... Two more to go. Yeah, Aaron wants me to do the other two. Maybe I'll start with the next one, like the one at the in the corner, and then... Mm -hmm think about doing the one what's the funny is that every single time you do one you're like oh why didn't I do that sooner I know. but you're at the time you're kind of like but I like the block I know I like the way <laughs> well you know what? it's good to be happy with them both ways right? you know what that's true yeah uh, and then I just walked through that flower bed and showed you what I needed to cut back and we did that and cleaned it up there wasn't a tremendous amount of cleanup in that area I did try out those DeWalt pruners the yeah. battery I don't know what they're called just battery operated yeah, pruners knows? yeah 20 volt pruners they were cutting now elderberry is pretty soft wood but they were cutting and i don't think that they were supposed to but they were cutting big branches i had yeah. to like do the trigger maybe two or three times to what get was through it, it supposed to be like inch and a half or two inch i think i think inch and a half oh is what you said i was definitely doing larger branches than yeah that. i think it all just comes down to how hard or soft the wood is yeah and elderberry is soft i don't think that those would do that great for like um like dead wood right you know? yeah mm -hmm. or like wood on our ash tree seems to be that seems remember, to be the hardest tree for me to prune i remember uh felco was talking about how you want for pruning out dead wood because you know how dead wood is like real dense yeah um and you don't want the you want the anvil type, right? Because mm -hmm. the bypass pruners means that it's like bypassing each other. Mm -hmm. The blade is bypassing the uh, other blade. Uh -huh. Like the stopper blade. Yeah, but then there's like <laughs> an anvil type where it like it comes to a stop. Yeah. And that's what you want for cl like clearing out dead wood. Uh -huh. So yeah, these wouldn't be great for that, but... They worked really well for this project though. And honestly, like, you know, loppers are awesome, but when you're getting into tighter areas like I was, it's hard with those long handles mm -hmm. to kind of maneuver around and get them in the right position and they get the right the leverage on everything. So anyway, I was pleasantly surprised with that. Uh, Tobe Meister said, what a wonderful transformation. Wondering if I can trim our black lace elderberry the same as you did today. Absolutely. They grow, kind of the same plant, yeah, right? Yeah, they grow kind of the same. So, yep, you can. And our neighbors actually did. They, Which, in their application, I loved them as shrub form because they're kind of standalones on that berm. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were absolutely gorgeous. They still are. That's the wonderful thing about elderberries. You can prune them up like I did or like our neighbors did, and they will return to their natural form the next season if you want them to. So that is you the nice part. Basically play around with whatever you yeah. want. And yeah, then... you're not locked in. Yeah. Jonna said, how tall are the North Pole Arborvitas now and how much have they grown since you planted them? Was it four years ago? What it was... It might have been five years. It was, it was five because I was pregnant with Benjamin, right? Mm -hmm. That year? Yeah, 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 you were. And Benjamin's five and mm -hmm. a half. And it was hot. We planted them at like 100 degrees. It was 104. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that day. They've grown, um, what were they, like hip high? They maybe? were right in the middle of the fence. So however tall that is, there's three yeah. rails to our fence, and they hit right about the middle rail. Mm -hmm. And now they're like double the size of the fence. Yeah, they're probably like 8 to 10 feet tall now. Yeah. And they're supposed to get... 10 to 15. 10 to 15. I think that 10 to 15 range is like if they're planted in more shade or cloud cover, then maybe on the lower end. But I think for us, with the blazing sun mm -hmm. they're soaking in a lot of energy with the sun yeah and so i think if they're getting you know fertilizer and water and a lot of sun i think they'll 
I wouldn't even be surprised if they go past because like the elderberries, you know, in our area, what do the elderberries say they cap out at? Oh, like eight feet or yes, something like let that. Me look at this. Hold and on. they get like. I remember I laughed when I us. saw that tag. I'm like, you guys are wrong. Yeah, that is not correct. But you know, that's before I realized how different everything grew in different parts of the country. Right. Yeah, six to eight feet tall and wide. Yeah, <laughs> and they get like twelve for us. Yeah. So I mean, that's like, like minimum. A, what's that like a thirty percent difference? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if the arbs also had a 30% difference, just given the amount of sun and, and nutrients that we feed them. And we, I mean, they've turned around big time this year. So Paul and Bethany actually went through, it was still winter, I think, but it was a nice day. And they went through and they cleaned out the center. You know how evergreens oftentimes, like the needles will catch in the center, especially in arbs. And they kind of, um, I don't know, they can harbor insects which that could be where a lot of our mite population was hanging out. Oh yeah. Um, because we don't have the mite problems this year. Like I don't believe in knocking on wood, but I feel like just in case, <laughs> um, we haven't had that problem this year. And I wonder if, I mean, they cleaned all of that dead out of all the trees. So that means more light, more airflow in the tree canopy, which I think is good. Um, you have really been working on the water. We added that extra drip line mm. to the ones behind the vegetable garden and they're looking beautiful this and year. And then tying them up. Yes, and you, know, you went through and to, tied them up. I had to tie them up, um, which honestly took me like an hour or two, mm -hmm. maybe just like an hour, mm -hmm. and they look fine. Like you can't see the black right string. They had kind of multiple leaders, which I guess is a pruning issue. If they've cut, like we didn't even realize that you had to like prune out leaders. I guess some growers will do, will do it. The ones we got, they weren't pruned like that. So you end up with like three or four different. Uh, Looking branches at them, trying though, to be leaders. I don't know how how you would prune them as they're growing you just, up. Like, do you just kind of top the ones that know. are and I, not I top still the don't center know. one? Yeah. Anyway, so, so they were getting like multiple leaders, and then they were flopping. And you right. like heavy rain, or uh, which we had this spring, heavy rain, or our snow load. Like any amount of wet snow that we got would just weigh those branches down. So yeah. What I'm hoping helped. is maybe after like a year or two of having the string wrapped around them. Um, I would just want to like test on one of them and I'll just cut the string. Mm -hmm. It's just basically just, like giving it a bear hug. Mm -hmm. um, cut the string and then see if those branches are now more strong that yeah. they've been kind of they forced. They can harden, yeah. harden in that So position. if they've hardened that way, great. I'll, I can cut the string off mm -hmm. of the other ones. But if not, I There's, don't know, just leave I the string I don't think it'll on. ever hurt them. Probably not. No. Uh, Zinia Zinia said, why don't you send the cat to a rescue? Oh, Douglas. If, if we had to rehome Douglas, we would find a good home for him. I mean, it's pretty easy to do. There's a lot of people. If he started like biting with, or. Yeah. I mean, he swipes, but it doesn't seem like there's any claws involved. No, it's, it's all just like the pads of his feet. Yeah. He's just like telling you pet mold. Yeah. And honestly, for a while there, we couldn't tell if he was male or female. And I think he's male and I think he's been neutered. Oh. So uh, that's what that's what I think. So mm. I think he belongs to somebody <laughs> around here, <laughs> and so yeah, I won't I won't be taking him to a rescue. He can hang out here as long as he behaves behaves himself. <laughs> um, and I know a lot of that stuff. A lot of you guys are saying I get a squirt bottle and whatever you know. A lot of work with a squirt yeah. bottle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bottle Garden UK said that looks excellent. I want an elderberry just so I can limit up. It looks so satisfying. Are there any shrubs that don't take well to this treatment? I haven't tried it out on a lot of shrubs. I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular. I feel like just about all shrubs. Because think about like uh, roses. Like you get those in tree form. But those have been specifically grown or grafted into a single stem. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, you could do multi-stem for sure. I mean, just, li you know, clean up all the leaves and then selectively prune out some branches. Uh, is the graft right at the, like the, the trunk is so, Okay, something so if else? you have a rose standard, like here's the trunk, here's the roots down here, here's the trunk, and then the canopy's up here. Sometimes it'll just be grafted up here right below the leaf canopy. Sometimes it's grafted there and at the base. Oh. So your trunk is something different than your roots and your top. Whoa. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, you know, there are some shrubs that might not recover like an elderberry would, like a nine bark maybe. Mm, right. You know, that might not recover its shape like an elderberry would. I mean, if you have a shrub that you don't like the shape of and you think it might look good as a tree form, you're not out that much. I've never if seen you just, nine barks get big enough to where you want it. There's some that'll get, yeah, and they're, I'm just throwing that out there yeah, as an sure. example. Um, 
yeah, if you really aren't happy with a shape and would rather a tree form, it's worth trying. And if it doesn't work, then pull it out and put a tree form of something else in there so that you like the way it looks. Um, Maria Jessup said, do you mind mentioning if you liked or disliked the new trimmers? Pros and cons. I, I don't know if I mentioned it in the video. I think I did, though, that I... I used it the entire time. I had to get in at the very end with my Felcos and do some finish work, some lighter trimming. Um, and that was just easier with my Felcos. But if you have like carpal tunnel or something yeah. like that, it's probably night and day. Yeah, for sure. It's, I mean, it's the tool trigger. itself is a little bit weighty, especially if you've been holding it for a long time. I know by the end, like my arm was a little tired. I think they but... have smaller batteries too. The battery that we had on there was probably a, a bigger 20 volt, but I've seen the new like power stack. Like a little. Yeah, they sell mm -hmm. these, um, like, they're lithium ion. I think they're called Power Stack. Mm -hmm. We don't have any, but that's like the newest DeWalt battery, and they look very thin mm. and light. So maybe if you couple, because the battery is like the heaviest part yeah. of the tool. It might be worth getting one of those to try just for that well, one Paul tool. Well, Paul was saying we might need a couple extra batteries. So maybe I will try one of those and batteries. See and see what the weight what, difference. Yeah. Over, over time, if your project is bigger, you definitely probably notice a difference. Uh, Julia said, how old are those elderberries? Probably three or four, maybe four years old fast growers yeah they're super fast um Gina's channel said can you tell us more oh Aaron can you tell us more about super thrive and how you apply it oh I don't know anything about super thrive uh, other than I just hear people like talk about it mm -hmm. is it a local thing I don't think so it's like a vitamin is it a national brand hold on hold on you're running kind of low yeah this is it right here it's uh, expensive what does the tag say for price One ninety nine ninety nine. yeah 200 bucks for that but it stretches bottle. It does. Really it's like far. it's like a beast concentrate. Here's what here's how I think of it, and I could be totally wrong. I don't know much about it, but it's like a really strong concentrate. I think of it when you're trying to like rehab plants. We never really use it for growing plants. Like we've had really good luck with the spoma stuff, but if we ever have something the spoma stuff is such a slow feed. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like you should be applying that all along mm -hmm. and you should have a, a healthy plant. But sometimes you get something that's like got spider mites mm -hmm. or whatever and you need to, it's kind of like chelated iron where mm -hmm. you just need to give something like a quick shot of nutrients. I don't even know exactly what's in there. Well, it's a, it says the original vitamin solution includes kelp. It's a quarter teaspoon per gallon of water, yeah. a quarter teaspoon, three ounces per 100 gallons. So, I mean, you can imagine how far uh, this is a gallon, that's 120, no, this is, yeah. One gallon, I thought one gallon was 128 ounces. This one says it's 148 ounces. Hmm. Am I wrong? Is a no, gallon 148? No, you're right. Yeah, so this is like a gallon plus, <laughs> I guess. Um, does it say a breakdown here? No, not really. Anyway, it seems to be helping, like with our locust trees. Yeah. I mean, it's worth a shot if you've got something that you love or something that's big that provides shade like our locusts that we want to rehab. It's definitely worth it. Yeah, I just feel like that kind of thing can maybe turn around your plant really quickly. But and, you know, maybe it would be fine to use all the time. It just seems so expensive. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Margaret said, do you have a discount code for Felcos? Yeah. Do we? Um, yeah. We'll put it on It'll the screen. Be on the screen. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Stephanie Bloom said, trimming up the elderberry does look tidier to me. Been wondering, do you grow chrysanthemums in your gardens there? Uh, chrysanthemums, I do have an edible chrysanthemum I'm growing in the cut flower garden. I will put in a few fall, well, very few fall mums. Sometimes I'll do mums. They're kind of a... It's a really short annual. They're like a nothing plant to me in the fall because they last for like a week at peak mm -hmm. and then they're done and then they'll crummy in your display. <laughs> so I'd much rather use pansies and cabbage and kale and those sorts of things and rudbeckia, you know, as, as fall plants. Chrysanthemums, as perennials in the garden, they last a lot longer once you plant them in the ground. The mums that we buy around here for our fall displays typically are perennial and you can plant them in the ground when you're done and they are really pretty that way. And I should do that in some areas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I haven't grown. I've got spider mums. One thing of spider mums up that I didn't plant. They were here. They're up by that big round boxwood by the Versailles Garden, by the birch tree. You know what I'm talking about. 
No. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, there is one patch of those that are beautiful, big white kind of spider mums. So it's something I should look into though, definitely. Next video was an update tour at our local community college, uh, TVCC. I just wanted to walk around and give you a look at how things were doing. I think it was 45 days they've been in the ground, mm -hmm. or 48, I can't remember, I said in the video. Um, we had some wins and we had some losses and it was all due to water. Basically this year, there were a couple of areas that were like, where the water they thought was on and it wasn't on. Thank goodness we got rain because we got just enough rain to where the plants, like they were struggling, but hopefully they'll rebound. Uh, and then there's a plant or two that I planted that I probably won't plant again. Um, so like low marks on Supertunia minivista scarlet, not maintaining its color whatsoever. It's bleaching out in the sun. But not all of them. Well, they're all kind of bleaching out. Mm. Some of them are a little darker than others. They were beautiful when we put them in the ground and I just thought, yes, and I wanted to use all mini vistas. And hindsight, now that I know, I would have put in really red. Super Tuna really red there. It seems to maintain color um, really well. And it's very vibrant and that's what I wanted. I didn't want a like whitish pink yeah. plant, but the ones in the ground do look like they're struggling more than one, the ones in the pots. So I think that's where the like drip issues mm -hmm. were happening. But anyway, you know, it's just the reality of gardening too, you know, seeing the the good and the bad. Well, because like I've noticed that uh, Bordeaux can tend to bleach out as well when it's really struggling. Yeah. So maybe if the plants were healthier, yeah. they wouldn't bleach as much as they are. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's one of those though that for me, like it's a red plant. So like probably won't give it a second chance because it's red and I don't know where I would plant it yeah. to try it again. You're you're already on the chopping block yeah. when, you're, when you're a red <laughs> yeah. plant around Laura. Um, well, it was kind of like the unplugged pink salvia. I mm -hmm. tried it two years in a row in the ground and in containers both years, and it didn't perform for, for me. And I know it performs for uh, like Heidi at Garden Crossing. She's like, it does great for me here, which is not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. You know, the Mini Vista Scarlet might do beautifully for you where you live. Um, anyway, it was a fun tour because I got there real, real early in the morning, and I th it was on the 4th of July, I think, really early in the morning. And I knew they'd be closed, and so there wouldn't be a lot of traffic or people around. It was just, it was perfect. Um, Trixie said, I have two pink gara plants, not proven winners, just regular nursery plants, and they bloom spectacular in spring. Now they look kind of stringy, and there are hardly any leaves at all. Do I cut gara back to the ground each year? Do I cut it back after the first flush of blooms? I love gara so much, but I hate that they only look fabulous early in spring. I would try cutting them back and see what happens, because if they look stringy and lanky, and yeah, just cut them back, give them some fertilizer, and they should flush back for you. Um, plants do weird stuff sometimes. The gara that we had around that fountain mm -hmm. was probably the best gara I have seen what brand, or what ever. What kind of gara was it? I don't it? know. It could have been Just... whirling butterflies. It was a perennial gara, gara and it was beautiful and it bloomed all season. Like mm -hmm. it just came up and bloomed until we cut it back in the fall. Um, is whirling butterflies a thing? Let me see. Am I remembering that? Yeah. It's a white gara. Whirling butterflies. I just want to check the, the zone on this one and the size, and then I can tell you for sure. Let's see, yeah, 36 inches tall, definitely. This is zone five through 10, so I bet you it was. The whirling butterflies, Gar Gara was an amazing one. The thing I like about the Gara, like the Caroly Petite Pink and the Stratosphere White is they're more petite. <laughs> and they are annual in our area, but they stay a lot smaller for container applications. That works out really well. Wanda said the flowers are beautiful. Is there a reason they did not mulch around the flowers, especially in the front entrance bed? I kind of wish they would. Yeah, I they think, have in years past. I think that they just bank on like the flowers filling in. Yeah. I don't remember them mulching. I remember them mulching in the gym bed hmm. because it was all landscape fabric. Yeah, maybe, maybe they didn't. But I don't remember a mulching up front. But yeah, that would elevate things. It always elevates well, things to cover know, drip tubes. If we, if we do it again and we have help, we could actually... We could mulch after we plant, but the problem is you, you kind of need, we would also have to do the drip as well. You have to test it, see if there's any, you know, Yeah, because you have to plant, run your drip, mm -hmm. make sure that it, you got the coverage and then mulch. Right. So it'd be a three-step process. Yeah. Which we could do. I don't know how their drip system works. I don't even, I don't even want to know how their drip I system know. works. It, yeah. I mean. Be kind of a can of worms. Yeah. That place has just been like added onto and added onto and. Different people had different ideas yeah. of how things should run. And it's uh -oh. funny how... Sorry. My mom's calling. Hang on. Hello? 
My mom wanted to know when we were making wheat wreaths, so we just scheduled a day. And I think that interrupted a thought you were having. Oh, I don't remember. I was probably done. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question was from Katie. Is there a special way you trim back sweet potato vine? I remember hearing once that if you cut it at the wrong place, the whole vine would die. But I don't remember. I mean, if you cut it off right at the root level, you're probably done for the Speaking season. Speaking of that, I feel like we should trim ours in those pots. You should do video about that. You think so? Yeah. They look like, good. Well, Whoa, that was, <clears throat> <laughs> they look good. <laughs> well, they're, they're a couple feet trailing onto the ground. Oh, the sweet point. potato vines. Yeah. yeah. But the petunias. That's what she asked, right? Sweet potato yeah. vines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can, I usually, I just follow it up and try to like match the rest of the leaf canopy of the rest of the stuff in my pots. And you just trim it right below like a, a leaf node, the next leaf node up. So you don't have like a, a random extra stem um, before your leaf, but there's no like particular spot you, you can or can't cut it. They're pretty aggressive vines. Bobby Pin said, you mentioned replacing the drip every couple of years. Do you replace the emitters only or all of the tubing too? We do try to, to replace the quarter inch drip tube that we put in containers every year. Mm -hmm. And I just need to do it, no matter if it's right. working in the beginning or not, because likely in the middle of the season, like in our raised beds, it'll be working in the beginning. And I think, oh, perfect. I can mm -hmm. just plant and we're good to go. And then, you know, middle of summer, I'm like, why is that basil plant like looking almost dead? And then I realized that the drip tube just got plugged or whatever, right. and it's not working by that plant. Um, so quarter inch every year, half inch. You know, it really just depends. We've got some stuff that has been in for five, six years, and it's still fine. Like we were talking, the boxwood hedges everywhere, like in Versailles mm -hmm. and around the fireplace area. Those have, uh, I think most of them have two drip lines running by mm -hmm. them, right? Right along the base. And we just put those in when we planted them, which is five years ago now. Yeah. And apparently they're still working because our boxwood hedges look great. great well the winter yeah. gems look really great i'm about ready in versailles to pop those out yeah they're I looking think, real i poor. think we're done with the sprinters um especially up there so uh yeah i think that'll happen here pretty quick i've got a pile of sprit of winter gems right here behind the greenhouse that i meant for the brick patio project that we were going to start last fall and didn't anyway we got some bigger boxwoods to put around there so we can use those yeah I think that would be a really good thing to do. Okay, next question from Jill said, curious though, with the college loving the cannas so much the last couple of years, why no cannas this year? Just didn't fit the Americana theme? No, I mean, they just love the cannas and they just kind of mentioned it offhandedly. Like it wasn't like plant more cannas. They kind of just give us a free reign to do whatever we want. And I just, I went a little overboard with the cannas last year. Maybe it wouldn't have looked so overboard to me had I used just one color but I used pink and yellow and I feel like that was too much because we had a lot of other plant varieties going on and I just wanted to simplify things. Cannas do have to be, they don't have to be deadheaded, but for me, they do have to be deadheaded. Like they don't have to be in order mm. to keep blooming, but they do have to be in order to look really nice. So I really wanted to cut down on any type of maintenance and I knew I was putting in geraniums, which is going to kind of take the place of the maintenance the cannas caused last year. That the geraniums like, look good though. The geraniums are awesome. Boldly red is what those are called. They're the same ones that I potted up and put in the Harley. They're like a, they're very cool red mm -hmm. and they are productive. Yeah. Uh, Chris said props to Rosa. Yes. Huge props to Rosa. She takes care of everything down there and she does all the hand watering. So the beds that were struggling have drip irrigation. She's not like hands-on as hands-on with those as she is with all the containers and beds that have to be hand watered because you think there's a drip system in there so it should be working right what it has been um, the past few years so anyway yeah she does a great job uh does she also have to spray for budworms on those tunias yeah i think yeah they do you know uh it's different at um commercial buildings because like I don't know if it's just Oregon or if all states kind of have this, but you know, you have to go through this process, even using organic sprays, you have to like put signs up and say, you know, we will be spraying on Thursday, you know, and you, I think you have to say like what spray you're using or something like that. You have to put signs like everywhere you're going to be doing it so that the public is aware. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do it at that specific time. And you know, it's, it's really hard to, to do that because like what if it rains the day that you're wanting to do it or it's like super windy and you're not mm -hmm. wanting your spray to blow around mm -hmm. it's a pain in the butt so they probably don't get sprayed as often as ours do here 
because yeah. we don't have to I mean, post every time we spray here at home. But I, I do know they've had bedworms in the past and they get right on it mm-hmm. and take care of the problem. So it's kind of, I think, just a watch and see sort of situation. CG said, how often is Rosa feeding the plants and is she spraying slash granules? I'm not sure of her exact schedule. I do know when we plant, we do the Biotone Starter Fertilizer or the Proven Winners Continuous Release Little Granules, both of which are a slower feed. So they've got something on board and something to feed on. Rosa was mentioning to me that she had just given them chicken manure. Hmm. So apparently that's what she had fertilized them with. And I don't know what the schedule is or how long that lasts. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Interesting to learn. I'll ask her. Uh, Amanda said, so if Proven Winners does the improve, do they stop growing the older version? Oftentimes they do. It's just a replacement. Well, it's not oftentimes. All the time they do. Mm-hmm. If it's an improved version, it's improved usually for a reason. It's a better growth habit, more productive in the flower department, more disease resistant, more heat resistant, whatever, or more small, you know, whatever, or, or bigger. So whatever the reason is, it is an improvement. So they want to get rid of the older version and sub it in for the new, which sometimes, most of the time I'm happy about, but sometimes like the color changes a little bit, like Super Tuna Bermuda Beach, the newer one is definitely, you love it. Mm -hmm. And I do like it. I do like it, but I loved the old one that it was a little bit more soft. Mm -hmm. It was like a soft salmon and the new one's like a bright tropical salmon. Mm. They're both pretty in their own way. And we have some of the newer one growing and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Next video was planting some dwarf thornless blackberries in containers. And then I planted some more warm season crops in our raised beds, mo- both vegetables and flowers. The blackberries, you guys, they are so good. They're called um, superlicious, superlicious dwarf blackberries. I saw them at the garden center and they were already loaded with fruit. And I'm like, I don't even have to wait. <laughs> like this is instant gratification. And so I picked up four of them. I think my mom's going to, she was, she was looking at them and she was yeah. uh, asking me, do we have any left of those? I'm like, I don't know. You're down there more than, yeah, it's your, <laughs> more than I am. Place. Uh, but she was thinking she maybe wants some too, but they're massive berries and they're so sweet. They weren't sweet when I <laughs> planted them that day. Um, Samantha tried one and it was, and I did too. They were still on the tart side, but we've been harvesting handfuls from those plants and they're so good. And it's also that kind of weird time of year where we're in between being able to start fall crops. It's still a little bit too early. We're getting a little closer now because I did this a few days ago. Um, one year I start last year, I think I started some fall crops on July 15th. So wow. I don't know what day it is today, but we're close to the 15th. What's the first day of fall? September like 20 something, right? Usually. I don't know. Anyway, um, our first average frost date is October the 4th, um, which it could happen before that. It could happen after that. Uh, I'm hearing we're going to have a long warm fall. Who knows? But what you do is you figure out your average first frost date, and then you count back to the day you're currently in. And that gives you your, gives you your growing window. Um, and then too, when you're kind of approaching that fall, that frost date, you know that the days are shorter, the nights are longer, the temperatures are getting cooler. So oftentimes it takes the plants a little bit longer to mature. So if you have, and I explained it in the video, like a 62 day bean, it matures in 62 days after you plant it. Uh, it might take 60, seven days, 68 days to mature because it just needs that extra time in the ground. So you want to add yourself a little buffer onto the maturity day of the thing that you're planting. That way you can be guaranteed something, you know, instead of putting in the time and not actually getting your harvest out of it. So I planted some honeydew melon and cucumbers. That might be the only two vegetables I planted or fruit and vegetables. And then the rest were flowers. So Cal said, what do you use for fertilizer on your veggies and fruits? So biotone starter fertilizer, land and seed compost when we plant, and then garden tone or plant tone or biotone, honestly, in the middle of the season. We just fertilized all of our tomatoes, corn, that sort of thing in the new property. And I used garden tone on mm-hmm. that. There's also tomato tone. If you want to like be very technical, they're very, very similar, um, but they might be slight, just slightly different in favor of whatever crop you're planting. Tiffany said, where did you get the metal plant tag you are holding in this video? I got it at my parents' garden center. It comes in a little kit. Like it's a perfect gift item, honestly, like a stocking stuffer because it's flat and they're not that, exp- well, I guess when you, for what they are, I feel like they weren't very expensive. I think it was under $10 and you get several stakes and a marker that goes with it, like a garden marker. Um, they're a real pretty shape. Mary said, do you have to plant more than one blackberry for pollinating purposes? Um, not, not in this case. These are self-pollinating. I don't know. Are there blackberries out there? I don't know a lot about blackberries. I don't know if you have to have, I don't, not that I've ever understood. Hmm. 
I've got four different varieties of blackberries planted out in our bigger garden area. And I don't even think that was a consideration. I just wanted thornless ones that were sweet. And I needed them to be semi-trailing, not the full-on trailing type, so that they wouldn't get massive. Vic said, can I ask why you didn't choose to use drip tape in the garden beds instead of the quarter inch? You could have used either one. You asked me the same thing. Well, your beds are a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, they're like they're only three feet. Yeah, but Alyssa's beds are three by six and three by yeah. fours, and we use drip tape. Right. It is a little wider, so it takes up more real estate in the the beds, which is not a big deal. Um, there's really no reason I should use drip tape. Maybe next time I will use drip tape because I keep having issues with. Well, it's nice too with the drip tape because you can turn off each row. Right. That's pretty convenient. That is convenient. Uh, Lori said, will your potted berry bushes have to be put inside during the winter? I think it's safest to do that. Oftentimes, if I pot stuff outside, I leave it out and just make sure to water it every two weeks. But in this case, I can't remember if the superlicious blackberries are a zone four or a zone five. You usually, if you're going to winter stuff over in containers, you want to choose plants that are rated two zones colder than what gro the growing zone that you're in. So Technically, in our area, you'd want to pick out something that's a zone four because it gives you that 20 degree buffer. In this case, because they are in terracotta, which I typically don't have bad luck have, leaving my terracotta out either. Like those four boxwoods in the garden, those have been out there for a while in terracotta and I've never had a problem with those. Uh, but we will probably pop those into the high tunnel. So the high tunnel we set up on the new property, you got the end walls, right, Aaron? Yeah, I did get the end walls. Um... You know, they had several kinds. I don't remember. I think it was just like a zip up uh -huh. kind of a thing. Is it I like recall. a center zip or is it two zips? I don't, I don't remember. I don't think it wasn't. They have like a door, an actual door, but you have to frame in the door, I think. And so I just wanted something yeah. easier because it's not something that we get in very often. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we'll see when we put it up. We're going to pop stuff like that in there this winter because it's not going to be heated like the other one here. Um, by the barn uh, it'll just be like a protective covering over plants so we'll probably put you know some japanese maples all of our maples in, in pots all of our japanese maples survived outside uh even the one in the box mm -hmm. like still in its nursery container in the box and i kept walking by it looking at it and i don't know why i didn't just put it somewhere <laughs> Um, but I just, you know those things that just kind of like... I think that's a protected area, though. It is pretty protected. Where where you had it. But it stays colder the longest there, too, because it's the north side. And the snow stays longest. Yeah. But it is protected from, like, the prevailing winds and right. any extra exposure. But anyway, I think we'll put them in the high tunnel. Uh, what the what says, um, I finally got how to install drip irrigation. Thank you so much. Laura, how, do, how deep do raspberry runners' roots go? I don't know. I think they go for days and days and days. Ugh. What is your suggestion for controlling those runners? You know what my suggestion is? You find a friend who wants raspberries and tell them they can have all the free raspberry plants they want and they will come dig them out. We have a friend that came in and this spring and dug out enough raspberry plants to do a 300 foot row. <laughs> and uh, I think she took some of them last year because she is um, harvesting fall golds off of them already. She texted mm. me and said, they're so good. Um, you can always find people who will come do it and you'll they'll, do the labor for free because they want the plants. So what do you win, do? Win. Just like dig down a little ways and then cut it? Yeah, so they just spread like this and then they'll pop one up and there's roots right below it. So you just mm. cut that runner and they're left with little roots sure. right down there. And they're tough plants. Tough unless you try to plant them in 100 degree heat, which I've tried to do and they'll kind of... Mm. You could use like the dead weed brew on those as well. It doesn't send stuff mm. back to the no. plant? Raspberries are like... Ugh. I've thought about, there's that bamboo guard. I don't know if that's what it's exactly called, but it's something you can put in the ground. It's like a thin, like super protective. So, you know, roots can't come out because sure. bamboo is so invasive. And I thought, oh, I wonder if it would be worth it to dig down. Bamboo will break through like almost anything though, won't it? I don't know. I wonder. Or go underneath anything. Oh, bamboo shield for tropical climates, 100 mil thick. How deep is it? 36 inch depth. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's pretty deep. <laughs> oh, there's some that's 24 inches. Like, I wonder if it'd be worth it yeah. to like pop that down in and so that they have nowhere to go. Right. And then you wouldn't have a problem at all. It's called bamboo shield. Christmas baby 51 said, love the berry plants. Will you be netting all your berries? Probably not. I was thinking maybe next year we'll net our honey berries. That's the only berry that the birds so far want to 
want to take after. Um, we're getting all the blueberries. I'm harvesting several blueberries every day. We did move the bird feeder. Paul moved that bird feeder, which makes me sad because it was so pretty on the grapes. But I got to thinking, like, it's probably the worst spot in our whole garden yeah. to put a bird feeder right next like right above all of our grapes all of our berries right there there are two honeyberry plants on the ground there as well but you know maybe if you're providing them food they won't eat the berries we'll just provide them foods like somewhere else yeah yeah so that is moved but i don't plan on netting it unless something becomes a problem next video was a work day at the garden center i went down just to help kind of revamp some displays it was really fun it was hot but it was really fun we brought out tons of hydrangeas like from you know, they had been tucked away um, in other areas of the nursery, but they were all looking so beautiful. I thought, oh, we need to get all of that up here in the front. They're looking so great. And it was just fun to work with some new concrete pieces that they had. And it was fun to just work with my mom and sister too. We had a good time. Uh, Sabrina said, how do the quick fire hydrangeas hold in bouquet style? They are so pretty and I wonder what their vase life is. Their vase life is really long. If you cut them, we have a video about cutting and, and like drying hydrangeas. If you cut them right, they'll just dry right there in the vase and look beautiful the whole time, forever. Uh, Julie said the two spruce lollipops that were on each side of the entrance. I have two like that and mine are growing in the same shape. I would like them to be more spheres, but I'm not sure how to approach uh, them. Any tips on pruning? Yeah, they just naturally have that more disc shape. You can go in and prune out candles. So like if there's, you know, three little blue, blue spruce, you know, branches coming off, you could come in and, you know, cut one off at the base and kind of do some selective pruning that way. I've not done that with a blue spruce topiary, but I'm sure it could be done. I would be selective about it though, not just shear up in a ball like you would a hedge because I think that would... I think that would look not right. Mm -hmm. Michelle said, I love watching you work with Monica and your mom. You're also darling. Could you give some design tips on how to integrate finials into landscape design? I love those pieces, but it meant a loss for wear and how to place them that makes sense. You know, the places that I see them that I like them the best is like if you have the two pillars, you know, um, flanking a opening or a whatever walkway and there are finials on top of that. I always just think of them in terms of pillars and raising them up, you know, tucking a pillar into a flower bed and then putting a finial on it. I don't do a whole lot of that. Mm -hmm. I think they're beautiful, but I just, usually when I'm placing stuff, it's containers and a couple fountains. Mm -hmm. Um, our statuary that's here, the Hebe, Hebe statue, angel statue, and that great big urn in Versailles, those were, and Persephone in mm -hmm. Versailles, those four pieces were here when we moved in. They came with the house. And I love them. We haven't touched yeah. any of them. I love them all, um, which is so, so nice. But I'm not a huge, like, garden ornament. I don't like a lot going on because I've got a lot of plant stuff going on. And I want to be adding more tables and benches and things like that. And I want it to look like I have some restraint <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, you have Teach to their show, own though. You have to show a little restraint because mm -hmm. you can, you can, there's like a line somewhere. It's too much of a good it's, thing. It can be kind of hidden. And yeah. you can go too hard on garden ornaments. Mm -hmm. Ornaments. Yeah, which that wasn't what the question was about, but... <laughs> That's kind of my approach on things like that. Miss J. Smith said, I thought of a question when watching the last recap video. I know you enjoy doing these things, but I wonder how often do your mom or sister try to lure you into projects by saying you can use it for a video? I don't have to be lured very often. No. Like, I'm lured all by myself. Yeah. Um, but Monica did try to say, like, well, you could film, you know, a work day out at mom and dad's house. <laughs> We're working in the garden tomorrow. Uh, and I thought about it for a second. We had other things going on. Uh, I get that mostly from other people. Like, you can use my garden as a, you yeah. know. <laughs> like, okay. Um, yeah. Shorty said, I love how large the plants are at the garden center. Do they have to order them in that way, or have they just grown that much this summer? They try to carry lots of different sizes of things in there. The only thing they really can't get in is, like, huge, huge things, because there's not enough space. I mean, you can see the space in there. They utilize all of it. Um, there are some big trees, but they're all containered. They're not, there's no B&B &B and nothing like real big. So like Aaron and I will go to Jaker on occasion. We have a load coming actually the tomorrow. next. Tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Or is it next week? No, tomorrow. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I thought yeah. it was another week out. We went and picked out a few larger evergreens, a couple of beautiful red oaks, you guys, mm, for the pond area because we want to be like... They are putting so much effort into this pond 
and they're like bringing in a bunch of crew and crew members and they're just they're they're going to be doing so much with this that we want to make sure that we're doing our part well so we went to jaker and picked out a load that they'll be bringing but we typically we go to andrews and we got that big load first mm-hmm. we always go there first and look for our stuff and then if we need something a little bit bigger or something that they don't have we'll run to jaker or wherever um and grab it but yeah they do try to order lots of things in varying sizes i know this year they got like roses and real small and clematis and real small they still have a bunch of the clematis i've been eyeballing them like oh i could just pop these all over and just let them ramble on the ground somewhere um because they're such a good price and they're so little and easy to plant which i do appreciate sometimes and then i do appreciate getting bigger plants than two Mm -hmm. at times last video for this week was this will be our largest shade tree plus planting a whole bunch of zinnias so we bought an exclamation london plane tree it's supposed to grow like 65 by 35 i think that's going to be top out our tallest shade tree and it's got huge leaves it's supposed to be like resistant to lots of different things and i've never messy well i like that was my one consideration because Alyssa had two of those Mm in her i think it was an older variety but had two of those in one of the homes that she lived in and they were massive and they provided a bunch of shade but they also like were a little bit of a chore (laughs) to clean the leaves up sure um but you get a big tree so much shade and the bark on those the bark there's nothing like it they're so pretty uh, and then I had planted, I'd started a bunch of the pink senorita zinnia seeds in the greenhouse. And I, the reason I did that instead of direct seeding uh, was I wanted to be able to plant them exactly where the water was. And it was perfect because you would just run the water and I could see where it had subbed out. Mm. So I didn't even have to plant it right by holes like I initially thought I was going to have to. I was able just to plant them in the area however I wanted because I thought I know exactly where the water is going and mm-hmm. you know these plants should be happy. I think there's one out there that is going to, it's dried up. Oh, like really? it just didn't get quite enough which is fine out of 199 zinnias yeah, that's how many we planted it's a good that's ratio. a pretty good ratio um, and then i went out to the cut flower garden and seeded a 60 foot row three times with zinnias and then half of another row with three rows of zinnias and they're all up already they're all it's the heat it gets them going fast uh nana said i've been watching you since the pandemic and you've changed my life. Oh, uh, what happened to the skinny fit ginkgo tree you planted? Have I just missed it on your tours? You might've just missed it. It's out there. It hasn't done a single dang thing. It's just sitting there, just sitting there doing, doing its thing. <laughs> well, a lot of our trees, uh, it, it's like three years, basically. Yeah. You plant them and they just sit. They're our, setting roots. Our <laughs> linden trees are just barely right now sending off these like shoots like they're like little dr seuss yeah shoots. and those were the first trees that we planted out there mm-hmm. higgins angel said i'm trying to find those seed trays with paper inserts i looked on gardener supply but can't find them they are on there it's a paper pot kit i think is what it's called maybe we can link it down below gardener so i'm gonna just check it out real quick paper pot yeah if you type in paper pots is it first thing that comes up oh okay gardener supply type in paper pots they are amazing the only thing about those is that i could see being any kind of an issue is if you don't have a a system or a setup where you can just let the water drain from the bottom because the trays that they come in have a ton of holes which is really good for airflow oxygen to the roots uh, because those paper pots are open on the bottom they're not all the way around it's just holding the soil in on the sides it's like soil blocking but easier because the soil doesn't have to stay together on its own it's staying in the paper pots but it's still free to do its thing on the bottom uh, you need to provide a tray underneath so like in here we could do that with the because these trays on these lights are closed on the bottom so they would catch the water Typically, though, I'm not using them in here. I'm using them in our greenhouse, and we just water on tables that are wood frame with the wire metal mesh, whatever, uh, hardware cloth. And so the water can just freely fall right below the table, you know, any extra water. So that's the only thing. I wish that, kind of wish that there was a tray included, mm-hmm. but I don't know if there's a reason why there's not, maybe. Could ask. I could ask because that would be nice. It'd be kind of a little bit more complete for the people who need to keep that water contained, which is, I think, a lot of people. And that was me for a long time before we had heat in here. Right. I mean, I've been gardening for a long time and starting seeds inside 
where water's an issue. You can't have it falling all over your stuff. So, But other than that, the plants grow great. They don't have to be potted up because it's a larger cell, uh, and the roots are just healthy and wonderful, and I love them. Pat said, so may I ask, why did you not use your cedar to plant the zinnias? You know, I got that. Is it a Chapin brand mm -hmm. cedar that I use for the corn and cosmos and sunflowers, and it worked so well? I didn't use it for the zinnias because I've got all those super hoops in the ground, and they're right in the way. Um, and I wanted to leave the super hoops just in case I want to use them again. I like the way they look. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. They were kind of a pain to get. They were a bit of a pain to get them all in the ground and get them. It wasn't, they're not a pain to get in the ground. It's a pain to get them all lined up in sort of the same height mm -hmm. and all of that business. Uh, Winora said, beautiful tree, how fast does it grow? Didn't we look that up? It was like a couple feet a year. Yeah. It's like two feet a year. Two to three feet a year, maybe. Yeah, because I remember us doing the math on like... Figuring out how many years. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you think about that. Like, well, yeah. what if we're here for 30 years? Yeah. And it'd be kind of fun to have a 60-foot tall tree. Right. Leanne said, does Paul and Bethany have a pretty yard at their house? You know what they have is a lot of animals. So Bethany um, has quite a number of kids, too. And they are busy. Like, busy with 4-H stuff. They do horses and pigs. I mean, a lot of our garden refuse goes to feed the pigs when we clean out the garden in the fall, like all the, you know, vegetables and stuff like that. And Bethany has a huge, huge vegetable garden. I don't know. They recently moved to this house. It's a fairly new house to them. And they haven't started doing a tremendous amount of, like, um, flower bed gardening. But they've got their livestock set up and a huge vegetable garden. I mean, you guys think I plant a lot of corn. She did 500 feet. 500 feet of corn! Um, plus all the other stuff, you know, so they've got a lot lot going on Vivian said where did you get the all dressed up roses? Are they proven winners? They're not proven winners and I don't know what brand like plant brand they are I saw heirloom roses. Uh, yes introduced them as like a, a new variety to them, to them. I think. It's been around because I've had them for I yeah. bought them two years ago. Yeah So we can link to heirloom roses. Yeah they're awesome. I know you can get them from there. They're the best, like one of the best roses we have on our property. Well, yeah. Yes. I, well, <laughs> if you're considering the the, the leaves, the, the structure leaves, and the, the leaves. growth structure, the color, when those were like peak, oh my word, you could see them from anywhere. And they bloomed for longer. And I didn't really pay attention to if they maybe started blooming a little later. So maybe they are a little bit later blooming. Mm -hmm. The other ones bloomed a little bit earlier. But I'm a huge pink fan anyway. So you get a, a rose like that that's got a huge bloom that's multi-petaled, has a good fragrance, and it's that pink color. And the leaves look so healthy. You know, it could just be the spot we have them in too. I mean, they get full sun all day long. Mm -hmm. They're not shaded. Eventually, they'll have to be moved. Somebody mentioned like, well, those roses aren't going to like that shade. Right. True. Nothing's going to like the shade that we have planted out there. We have to We plant. will like it. We will love it. And we'll transition the garden into shade garden once it's there. But, you know, it starts off a sun garden. Yeah. And the last question, cutest little boy ever. Check. <laughs> yeah, Benjamin was doing his checklist for me. Uh, and he was pretty like... I already did the check for that, Mama. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was trying to be a little bit more on it with the check marks. Like, okay, ben Benjamin, Zinnia's done. Check. And he's like, I already did the check mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already doing it. Question regarding the rule of thumb for trees. Plant them high and they won't die. Is the rule the same for larger shrubs? And I'm assuming it's the same for evergreen shrubs and trees. I think it's like if you err on that direction, you'll be have more luck than the opposite direction. I think direction. that most plants want drainage. And if you, yeah. um, like if you hill them just a little bit to where you know you don't want them sunken in the ground because then the water pools yeah but if you if you plant them to where like the root ball is about an inch or so above grade mm -hmm. then you know you just put like some compost or some soil or whatever to where it just kind of mounds up just a little bit mm -hmm. and it facilitates water drainage away especially yeah. i think for for people who get a lot of rain mm -hmm. for us it's I mean, we water with drip irrigation, so it's similar where, you know, you have drip right around the root ball yeah. and you, you kind of need that to, to go away as mm -hmm. well. You don't want that pooling and right. sitting in there. Right. And there's some plants that you want to do it definitely, like buddleias, butterfly bushes, definitely plant them high, mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of things. Can you think of anything that you don't want to plant high? No. Joe was telling me, your brother was telling me that he's got a birch tree. I was just thinking like things that love water, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe you could plant that lower, but he's got a birch tree that was kind of mounded up, mm -hmm. like planted on a berm sort mm -hmm. of. And his birch tree is like the biggest in the subdivision. It's because uh, he said beautiful. that the builder that did his house mm -hmm. built several other houses and did kind of the same landscaping uh -huh. and each, like the same plants. Uh -huh. 
Um, but his birch tree is like doing better than everybody else's. So, but, and it was, it was mounded a bit. So it's a paper bark birch and it's so beautiful. It's so pretty. And that's it you guys for this week's recap video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're all having a great week and we'll see you in the next one.